Hello there, my friend. This is Janine, and you're listening to the Sort Yourself Out podcast. Today, we're discussing all things karma. So make yourself comfortable, as this is going to be a juicy one. I'm your host, Janine Hunt, natural health therapist for over 30 years, hypnotherapist, lifelong student, and spiritual seeker. I like to seek out the most effective practices and techniques that provide the greatest bang for my buck and the fastest route to freedom from whatever is holding us back. I can't wait to share with you these powerful techniques so that you too can sort yourself out, know deeper meaning in your life, and best of all, a sense of inner peace. So let's get started. Well, hello there. I deeply appreciate you joining me today for a discussion of one of my all-time favorite topics. Yes, it is so favorite that one day I want to write a book about it. We are talking about karma. And we'll also be digging into reincarnation, because you can't have one without the other. They're like two sides of the same coin. So I just want to go over what we'll be discussing in this three-part series on karma. This week's episode is Karma 101. We'll be looking at what karma is, how it operates in our lives, and addressing the elephant in the room when it comes to karma. And it's a big elephant. Part two in our series is even more juicy because we'll be discussing how to work off your karma. We'll be getting into some deeper karmic principles so we can appreciate how we're generating our karma and delving into some qualities that we need to cultivate in order to work it off. And I'll be sharing a really quick and easy practice that has a big impact on reducing the karmic implications of all the stuff that you get up to. In part three of our karma series, we'll be looking at how to walk the talk if you believe in karma, because there should be some conscious effort to modify and evolve your actions if you believe that karma is a thing. So in part three, we'll be looking at the stuff we learned in parts one and two and giving it a more practical spin, both for how we live our lives individually and as a society. Well, I cannot wait to get stuck into this topic, so let's dive in right now. Now, most of us have a concept of what karma is. We've all heard things like what goes around comes around, you get what you give, like attracts like, and all of these are expressions of the law of attraction, of which the law of karma is a part. But I want to look more deeply at just what karma is. Here is a definition from the Ageless Wisdom Teachings. Karma, the law of cause and effect, or sowing and reaping. Karma means action and its coming into effect. In the mental, emotional, and material worlds, no good deed can escape its reward, and no evil deed its fit penalty. By this law, our characters are the exact product of our past evolution. Therefore, the future is now in our own hands. And I've got another definition for you by Christmas Humphreys, and he says, Karma is the expression of the law of equilibrium, and nature is always working to restore that equilibrium whenever, through man's acts, it is disturbed. Karma creates nothing, nor does it design It is man who plans and creates causes, and karmic law adjusts the effects. Karma neither rewards nor punishes. It only restores lost harmony. Now, there are various different kinds of karma, which I'm going to get into in a moment. But first, I'm going to unleash the elephant, the elephant in the room, And this elephant plops himself down into the room in almost every conversation I've ever had about karma. So here's the thing. There is an emotional gut reaction that many people have when you mention karma. You can practically see their barriers going up 
and their mind closing down before they say, nope, I'm not having it. How can you say that that poor little baby born with that terrible affliction deserved it? What could he possibly have done to deserve that? What kind of warped, vengeful God could come up with a concept like that? So, people's main objection to karma is this kind of emotionally charged reaction. And if we're coming at karma from an emotional level, it will seem like some perverse act of retribution by a vengeful God. We tend to think of retribution as punishment, but it actually means to return. It's the return of whatever has been put out in the form of action. Now, Torkom Saradarian said in his book, Questioning Traveler and Karma, This present life is nothing else but the fruit of the seeds that were planted in past lives. So, rather than having this emotional gut reaction, if we can uplift our consciousness from the emotional level to the mental level, we can step back a little and view with some dispassion the bigger picture of life, and that we can then see karma as a benevolent law in which we're given countless opportunities to correct our mistakes and misdeeds. So while we can and should most definitely look at that poor baby born with afflictions with compassion, is it too far to go to suggest, and okay, I'm going out on a limb here, that perhaps that baby was a total asshole in a previous existence? (laughs) Okay, now I'm joking a little here. It's not as cut and dried as that. But karma is a deep mystery. And it's just not that easy to understand. So I'm doing my best with my own little mind that also struggles with these big concepts and that likes to get a little sweary when it's insecure. So back to the little asshole. Is it too far beyond the realms of possibility that that poor soul did some things in a previous existence and that maybe he will be learning some valuable lessons through living with the affliction that will allow him to progress to higher levels in his soul's journey? Or another possible scenario. Maybe his mom was a total asshole in a past life and they had a soul agreement that before they were both born that his condition, the baby's condition, would facilitate the development of some qualities that would help the mother to evolve or to work off her karma. You've got to admit that people do do some terrible things. You'd probably be willing to entertain the thought that someone like Hitler might have some serious karmic implications to deal with, yeah? But we can't know how or when they will manifest. Many people don't want to accept the principle of karma because they've got a victim mentality where they think stuff just happens to them. There's a lot of victim mentality going around today. Why me? Why does it always happen to me? But why not you? Would you rather lay it on someone else? So many people do not want to accept their personal responsibility for their lives. And sure, it can be a bitter pill to swallow that on some level you are living out the consequences, the effects of past actions or causes. But the more aware you become, the higher your consciousness, the harder it is to remain a victim and be utterly in denial of your personal responsibility. There are consequences to all of our actions, thoughts, intentions, desires, and speech. Of course, we're not aware of all this until our consciousness is advanced enough, until we've reached what's known as the continuity of consciousness that transcends death and birth and can look into the Akashic records to see what's been going on. In The Light of the Soul by Alice Bailey, it says that The Akashic Record is like an immense photographic film registering all the desires and earth experiences of our planet. And of karma and the Akashic Records, Torkum Saradarian says, When one is talking about karma, 
he is talking about a great energy system, about a system that is a supercomputer in space itself. Not a single action is lost. Instead, each word, each action is computed in that big machine of space. By space, we do not mean an empty vacuum, but an energy network that automatically and naturally produces a reaction to any action. The law of karma is nothing else but the result of either acting according to the law of nature or breaking the law of nature. The greatest law that one can have in his mind is the law of love. Any act against love will cause a reaction. Okay, so that leads me on nicely to discuss the various kinds of karma. Alongside that law of love that governs the universe is another big concept affecting karma, and that is that we are all one. So anything that goes against the good of the whole will have karmic implications, and not the good kind. And if you think about all of life on this planet, including the mineral, vegetable, animal, human, and superhuman kingdoms, we're going back billions of years, and that's a lot of interaction. There's a lot of karmic water under that bridge. So, as one all-encompassing organism, there are karmic obligations playing out on a huge scale that we cannot fathom across the eons of time. Most of us think of karma as belonging to individual humans, but there is also group karma, such as family karma, national karma, racial karma, the karma of the human family as a whole, and the karma of the different kingdoms of nature. And we have responsibility in all of these. National karma, such as the wars carried on in the Middle East, Ireland, and the former Yugoslavia, and other places as well, can go back hundreds of years. The United States bears the national karma of slavery. And that is an instance of national karma that we began to see being redressed, coming back into balance somewhat in the 20th century through the civil rights movement. But so often, hatred and pain and suffering go on in an endless cycle, perpetuated across hundreds of years as hatred is responded to with hatred, creating more of the same. And balance and harmony can never be achieved by that. The Buddha said that hatred ceases not by hatred, hatred ceases only by love. So, this is a difficult thing with karma. We could be facing the effects in this incarnation of causes that began ages ago or that stemmed from various incarnations, maybe several incarnations combined. And it can take a long time for karma to work itself out, which can really make it seem like an unjust world and an unjust law. But the universe works on a much greater time frame than our human time frame. We're going, what we're going to face of our personal karma is decided by our soul before birth. Things will be addressed according to opportunities of the era, as well as associations with the people that we have karmic bonds and obligations with. Apparently, we reincarnate again and again with the same major players in our lives, in different relationships each time around, that permit the redressing of old karma. So your mother might become your son, your brother might become your mother. And when the karma is worked out and there's harmony and balance, then you are freed. Everyone is freed of these karmic bonds and you not, no longer need to continue incarnating together yes, as a group. And some of our most difficult relationships are most likely karmic bonds where we get opportunities to redress the balance. And then there are also people whom we feel a great affinity for, and they are, they are possibly people that we've worked with in past lives and have a really great connection with. You know that feeling when you meet someone 
and you feel like you've known them all your life? Well, maybe you have known them in past incarnations. All right, here, according to the Ageless Wisdom, are three types of karma that affect humanity. The first is karma that is generated out of deep ignorance and the result of being in dense physical form. We negate this karma by becoming more conscious. We correct it through experience and greater knowledge. The second kind is karma that comes from having a materialistic focus for too long of a period of time, and this is corrected by the development of the spiritual consciousness. Now, I'm not saying here that we shouldn't have comfortable homes and a good job to support the family, but that a materialistic focus is appropriate for certain kinds of growth and development. But when its purpose is served, it's time to move on to greater things that do not weigh us down and keep us anchored to the physical plane like materialism does. And thirdly, there is the worst kind of karma, and that is karma that comes from willfully and deliberately choosing to harm in order to selfishly serve oneself, knowing that it causes pain and suffering to others. And we have freedom of choice to avoid all of these kinds of karma. Now, I'm going to wrap this up in a minute, but I just want to expand this discussion of karma out to an idea that I find fascinating. And that is that the human kingdom even has karma with the animal kingdom. I'm going to read you a bit from a book called Esoteric Psychology, Volume 1 by Alice Bailey and the Tibetan Master. It's a bit long, but it's a fascinating look at karma. So here goes. I'm quoting now. The relation of the animals to man has been purely physical in the long past ages. Animals preyed upon men in the days when animal man was but little removed from them. It's oft forgotten that there was a stage in human development when animal man and the existent forms of animal life lived in much closer relation than today. Then, only the fact of individualization separated them. It was, however, an individualization so little realized that the difference between the mindless animal, so-called, and infant humanity was scarcely appreciable. In those distant eons, much transpired which has been lost in the dark silence of the past. The animal world was then far more potent than the human. Men were helpless before the onslaught of animals, and the devastation wrought by animals upon early animal men in middle Lemurian days was terrible and appalling. Little nomadic groups of human beings would be completely wiped out age after age by the powerful animal life of the period. And though instinct taught the animal men to take certain precautions, it was an instinct but little removed from that found in their enemies. It was only as the millennia of years passed away and human intelligence and cunning began to assert themselves that humanity became more powerful than the animals and in, and in its turn devastated the animal kingdom. Up until 200 years ago, the toll of life exacted by the animal world from the human in the forests of the western continents, in Africa, and in the primeval lands of Australia and in the islands of the tropic seas, was incalculable. This is a fact oft forgotten in the sentimentality of a moment, but it lies at the root of man's cruelty to animals. It is but the inevitable karma of the animal kingdom working out. The question must be viewed from a larger scale than has hitherto been the case, and its true historic values must be better understood before man can intelligently decide what constitute his problem of responsibility and how it should be met and solved. Unquote. Wow, gosh, that was a bit of a whopper. Now, I don't know how I feel about that. But it sure does give me an insight into the scope and time span of karma. It leads me nicely to what I want to leave you with today, 
because it's what I need to do to wrap my head around those concepts of karma that I don't like down here in my little animal loving emotional mind and body. And it's also what those people who uphold the elephant and who outright reject the principle of karma need to do too. In order to comprehend karma, we really need to broaden our perspective. We need to try to view existence from the standpoint of eternity. Oh, how I love that phrase. It just stirs my heart and soul. I feel like I should add some reverb and echo to it. We need to view existence from the standpoint of eternity. Easy peasy, right? Well, maybe not, but don't worry, as next week's episode, part two in this series on karma, is all about how we can foster that expanded perspective. I'll be discussing a few spiritual qualities that we need to cultivate in order to wrap our heads around karma. Plus, I'll be sharing with you a really easy and quick exercise that you can do to start working off your karma. Indeed, that's what part two of this karma series is called, How to Work Off Your Karma. And the following week in part three of our karma series, we'll be looking at how to walk the talk if you believe in karma, because there really should be some conscious effort to modify and evolve your actions if you believe that karma is a thing. So in part three, we'll be looking at stuff we learned in parts one and two, and we'll be giving it a more practical spin, both for how we live our lives individually and as a society. So I really hope you'll join me for that. Now, I have got a freebie for you today that will help you to view existence from the standpoint of eternity. It's my free quick start guide to doable meditation. The guide gives you really simple, no fuss instructions on how to meditate. And I am talking here a form of meditation that only takes five minutes, so no excuses. It also includes tips to make sure you can fit it into your day and move past any resistance you might feel about starting a meditation practice. So do give it a go. I can tell you, meditation is the best thing that I've ever done for myself in terms of my well-being. And I think that if you do give it a go, that once you start, you won't want to stop. And remember, it's only five minutes. I'll put a link in the show notes, or you can get it at the inspirationcloud.com slash S-Y-O-13. And those are the digits 1-3, not the word 13. So that's the inspirationcloud.com slash S-Y-O-13. Now, if you're interested in learning more deeply about all of these fascinating and life-enhancing topics, I have some really exciting news to share on how you can amplify your own well-being as well as your positive impact in the world. Because in a couple of months, I will be opening the doors to my new membership experience called the Inner Circle. In this monthly membership, I'll be offering my most powerful top-down techniques to sort yourself out, to free yourself of your hang-ups and blockages, to take charge of your mind, and to nourish your soul. There'll be mini-courses, hypnosis sessions, guided meditations, tapping videos, neuro-linguistic programming techniques, mindfulness training, the ageless wisdom teachings, and more, so that Wherever you are on your path to greater well-being, you can just start where you are and then take the next step. You'll have the tools, practices, and techniques you need to not just heal your life, but to make it more meaningful, fulfilling, peaceful, and beautiful. So, if you're ready to transform your well-being and would like to be kept informed, go on over to the inspirationcloud.com slash membership to get on the wait list and I'll keep you updated. I'll also put a link to this in the show notes. Well, my friend, 
I have had such a blast waffling on today about my favorite topic. It just turns my crank, Karma, and I hope you found it helpful and interesting. And hopefully I'll see you next week for part two. So I just cannot thank you enough for listening today. I really do appreciate you choosing to spend your valuable time with me. So have a great week. Be good. (laughs) Bye. Thanks so much for listening. I really hope you found this podcast helpful and full of uplifting ideas that you can put into practice in your life. And if you have, chances are your friends and family will too. So please share it with them on social media. You'll be helping them to sort themselves out because I bet you think they need it, right? But seriously, you'll also be doing me a huge favor in return and I will be eternally grateful. I would also love it if you would leave me a review on iTunes, preferably a nice one, please. And don't forget to subscribe to the podcast too. If you have any questions or would like me to address a certain topic, I'd love to hear from you. You can email me at info at theinspirationcloud.com. Have a good one. Thanks again. And I'll see you next week.